Jesus Christ is the very focus and center of the Christian religion. But what role does the church have in its relationship to Christ? On our program today, we will explore that question. Till the good news was written and the full truth revealed, that the church might be whole and Christ's fullness made real. Our Lord in His wisdom gave Welcome to The Truth in Love, and now your host, Dave Miller. Greetings. Thank you for tuning into our program today. We begin with this program a new series on the subject of the church, the church of Christ. As you think about the Christian religion, first of all, think with me about the fact that on this planet there are many different religions, many different world religions we call them. There's Buddhism, there's Hinduism. Uh, there is Islam, and of course, there is Christianity. Under the umbrella of Christianity, is it not the case that we think of Christianity in terms of major churches, major movements? Generally, we think in terms of two groups, Catholic and Protestant. When we think of Protestantism, which originated in the 14th, 15th century, we think of various denominations we call them. The word denomination in our English dictionaries means a designated or named division. And therefore within Christianity we have a number of different churches, different Protestant uh, movements, you know, from Baptist and Methodist to uh, Lutheran and Congregationalist and Anglican. Literally hundreds, some have even uh, counted the fact that there are thousands of different religious groups that all claim to be Christian, separate and distinct churches, denominations. That is the portrait, that is the picture that we have in our day, in the 21st century, as we think of or conceive of the Christian religion. But you know what? When we go back to the Bible, we get a completely different picture. Is it not our responsibility to go back to the Bible? Isn't the Bible the one and only source of inspired information, information that comes directly from the one and only God of the universe? There's really nowhere else for us to go on this planet to get a pure, undiluted source for understanding who God is and what He would have us to be and to do. And therefore, we must go to the original source book, the guidebook that God has given us by inspiration. It's the only infallible book on the planet. You can absolutely rely upon the book we call the Bible as being the actual words of God. I hope you have your Bible. I hope you have something to write with and some paper. And you will jot down passages of Scripture as we go through them in order to understand the church to understand God's view of the church. What is the role of the church in the grand scheme of redemption? What is the place of the church in the Christian religion? How would God have us to relate to Him in terms of the church? Let's begin by asking the question, what is the church? You know, in our New Testaments, written in Greek originally, the word translated church is the word ekklesia. Ek is a Greek preposition that means out of. Klesia is a form of kaleo, the verb kaleo, to call. So the ekklesia, the church, literally means the called out. The ones who have been called out. And this term is used uh, in our New Testaments to refer not only to what we would think of as the church, the saved, it's also used to refer to any group of people that's been called together uh, for the purpose of gathering and assembling. It's even used in the book of Acts to refer to a street mob that meets and gathers uh, in the street for illicit purposes. But God took the term and applied it to the group of saved people. That is, those who have been called out of the world, called out of sin, those who have been gathered together, clustered together in order to form God's people, the group, the assembly, 
Here is the body of Christ on earth. This uh, group of people, therefore, is referred to in our New Testaments as the church. And the word church, as a matter of fact, even in that sense, in the spiritual sense, is used two or three different ways. It can refer to the actual worship assembly where Christians come together and meet together and sing and pray and study the Word of God. It is so used in 1 Corinthians 14, for example, where the word church means the worship assembly. It's used in a broader sense to refer to that group of people regardless of where they are. So the New Testament speaks of the church at Rome or the church at Corinth. Even in a non-assembly setting where members of the church live in a town, they form the church. Even, even though they've not come together in one place in order to worship. That too would be called the church. Then the word church is used in an even broader sense to refer to all Christians, all saved people on the planet. Every person who is a part of Christ's body, who is saved and acceptable to Him, form the church universal uh, on the planet. But that's the subject of our study, the church of Christ. What is the church of Christ in terms of God's will for the church and how we individually are to fit into that greater context of this tremendous organism, this entity that is referred to in the Bible as the church. You know, when you go back to the Old Testament, you find references to the coming Christian era. I'd like for you to take your Old Testament and flip with me back to some of these great Old Testament references. For example, Genesis chapter 3. You know, Adam and Eve were placed in the garden originally by God, the first human beings. In chapter 3 of Genesis, they sinned and God would then expel them from the garden. But before he did that, in chapter 3, verse 15, after pronouncing some sentences against the man and the woman for their participation in this sin, look carefully at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God sends up this little red flag, a little indication of his ultimate intention to deal with the sin problem as it has been instigated by this first human pair. He says in chapter 3, verse 15, speaking to the, the snake, Satan, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. I am confident that Genesis chapter 315 is a prophetic reference to Jesus Christ. In other words, God was here saying to Satan, there is going to be enmity between you and the woman. And I think by woman here, he means the woman who will bring Jesus into the world. He says between your seed and her seed, he will bruise your head, Satan. That's a reference to Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, this is a reference to the crucifixion. When Jesus died on the cross, he bruised Satan's head. That is, he dealt him a blow that would prevent him from consuming everybody. In other words, people have an, an out. They have a way to come out from under the dominion of Satan and sin. They can come out from under his grasp through the redemption that is available in Christ. And that is the way in which Jesus bruised Satan's head. A good cross reference here would be Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, where we are informed that when Jesus died on the cross, He destroyed, the text says, Him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Well, Satan is not destroyed in the sense that he is now non-existent or he has been uh, imprisoned or incapacitated, but rather his efforts to draw everyone into hell with no, no way for people to avoid that has been nullified. God has provided atonement. He's, he has provided a means by which people can be forgiven of their sin and consequently avoid the consequences of their sin, which would be life forever in hell with Satan himself. So chapter 3, verse 15, even though Satan participated in the crucifixion of Jesus, Ironically, in fact, irony of the ages, 
that crucifixion, that killing of Jesus actually wound up being the very means by which Satan's ultimate efforts would be thwarted and people could be forgiven of sin. So here at the very beginning of the Bible, the very beginning of human history, the very beginning of the human race, God indicates that He is going to send the Savior by which people can be forgiven. Now as you proceed through the book of Genesis, you come a few chapters later to Genesis chapter 12, where we are introduced to a man by the name of Abram. He is from Ur of the Chaldees. In Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3, three promises are made by God to this man, one of them involving his physical lineage, that is that the nation of Israel would actually grow from uh, his physical body. The nation of Israel uh, descended from Abraham. A promise is made regarding land, the land of Canaan that God would give to that particular nation, the Jewish nation, fulfilled in the book of Joshua when God's people, the Israelites, went into the land of Canaan and conquered it. And then uh, thirdly, a third promise that is made in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Listen closely. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. What do you suppose Abraham understood God to mean when he said that? And when Abraham then had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons that formed the 12 tribes of Israel, and though all of those people came into existence, and they thought back about their father Abraham, what do you think they interpreted that statement to mean? In you, in you, Abraham, all the nations, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Well, I'm not certain what all the Jews thought about, but I will tell you this. The history of Judaism shows that the Jews felt that they were, they were exclusive, that they were unique in their relationship with God, and therefore they didn't have much to do with non-Jews, Gentiles. They certainly didn't feel that Gentiles, non-Jews, could be acceptable to their God. And yet here was God telling their forefather Abraham, the one who actually instigated their existence ethnically, that it was through him that all the families of the earth, not all the Jewish families, but that all the family, all nations, one, uh, one of the prophecies says in this, in this same setting, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. What's he talking about? If you'll keep your finger in Genesis chapter 12 and go with me to the New Testament, specifically to Galatians uh, chapter 4, and look at the statement that is made there uh, rather, Genesis chapter 3. Look at the statement that Paul makes there in his letter to these Galatian churches scattered throughout the, uh, the province of Galatia in the first century. He says in verse 16, Gen uh, Galatians 3, verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, quote, and to seeds, end quote, as of many, but as of one, quote, and to your seed, end quote. That's a reference back to Genesis 12. He says, and to your seed, who is Christ? So Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, when God said, Abraham, through you, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. That was a reference to Christ. In what sense? In the sense that Abraham would produce Isaac, Isaac would produce Jacob, Jacob would produce the 12 patriarchs, and over the centuries, down through that lineage, Jesus would come into the world. You remember Jesus was born to Mary and Joseph. Joseph, of course, had nothing to do with the birth of Jesus uh, physically, but Mary did, and she was descended all the way back uh, from Abraham. So God, in a second prophecy, very early in human history, indicates His intention to bring Jesus into the world to make it possible for people to be forgiven of their sin. Now, as you proceed through the book of Genesis, you come on down in time and uh, Isaac comes onto the scene. His 12 sons come onto the scene, or rather Jacob, uh, Jacob and then his 12 sons come onto the scene. You remember the story of Joseph in Genesis chapter 37, extending to chapter 50. Turn with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 49, where we find yet another Old Testament reference to New Testament intention on God's part. In chapter 49 of Genesis, we find a series of prophecies uttered by Jacob regarding his various sons. 
And one of those is found in chapter 49, verse 10, in his assessment of his son Judah. Among other things, he says that his son Judah, verse 10, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm. Really, that's what this is referring to. Genesis 49.10 is a reference to the coming of Jesus Christ. You remember Jesus, being a Jew, was born into a family who was of the tribe of Judah. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God says, I'm going to make it possible for people to be forgiven. Genesis 12, 3, I'm going to do this through Abraham. He narrowed his redemptive intention down to one family group, one person. In chapter 49, verse 10 of Genesis, God narrowed that down. Not all of Abraham's descendants would bring Jesus into the world, but rather the tribe of Judah. Now again, as you continue through your Old Testament, and see actual human history being recorded and reported to us over a period of centuries. We next come to uh, the book of Deuteronomy. If you will, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 18. By this time, we're at about 1500 B.C. Moses is the leader of the nation. Uh, the people are at Mount uh, Sinai. They've been wandering in the... Uh, actually, they've wandered in the desert for 40 years... And now in the book of Deuteronomy, they've left Sinai. They are at the southernmost region of the land of Canaan. They are south of the Dead Sea, uh, southeast of the Dead Sea. They're ready to go in and take the promised land in the book of Joshua. Deuteronomy was written in order for Moses to re-educate the nation because the older generation had died off, a new generation had come into being. Look carefully at Deuteronomy chapter 18 where Moses makes this statement. Verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Do you know that if you go over to Acts chapter 3 verse 22 and other passages, Deuteronomy 18, 15 is indicated to be a reference to Jesus Christ. When Moses said, God's going to raise up a prophet like me, but you better listen to him. He was talking about Jesus. And that would be 1,500 years later than when Moses actually uttered this statement. And yet another clear indication in the Old Testament that it was God's intention all along to create and to bring into existence the Christian religion. That is, a religion that is focused upon, centered upon, and exclusively involving the Son of God, Jesus Christ Himself. And as we go through our Old Testaments, we find reference after reference like this, especially when we come over to the prophets. When we come over to the writing prophets of the Old Testament, we find prophetic reference after reference to the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. You know, for example, in Isaiah 53, most people are familiar with that chapter that talks about the suffering servant, a clear reference to Jesus dying on the cross how we as sheep have gone astray and He came and offered Himself and bore our stripes and suffered for us. A reference to Jesus. And you know, as you talk to Christendom, as you talk to people under the umbrella of Christianity and whatever denominational affiliation, they, they, don't, they wouldn't agree with anything I've... They would not disagree with anything I've said up to this point. They would agree that the Bible predicts that Jesus would come, that Jesus would die on the cross for our sins, that you have to accept Jesus Christ or you cannot access the forgiveness that He offers through His blood. And yet it's incredible to me that as you go through this Old Testament, you find references to yet another central feature of God's scheme of redemption. In addition to references to the Christ, you have references to the church. For example... Turn with me, if you would, to the prophet Isaiah in your Old Testament. Very early in his prophecy, in fact, chapter 2, we find an unmistakable reference to God's ultimate intention to bring into existence not only Christ on earth, but the church on earth, the kingdom of God. 
Listen carefully to Isaiah chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 1, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 2, it shall come to pass in the latter days, the last days, that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established in the top of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills. All, listen to this. All nations will flow into it. I wonder what the Jews listening to this Jewish prophet Isaiah thought about that. All nations will flow into God's house, not just the Jews, all nations. He says, many people will come and say, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God. He'll teach us His ways. We can walk in His path. Listen to verse 2 or verse 3. For out of Zion, that's a reference to Jerusalem. Out of Zion will go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. See the Hebrew parallelism? The law will go forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, same, saying the same thing. And then notice verse 4, He will judge between the nations, rebuke many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn war anymore. You know, people think that's a reference to some future time when there will be universal peace on the planet. No more war, no more, no more swords, no more spears, no more human conflict. And yet, as we continue our study of God's Word, we're going to see that's a misunderstanding of this passage. This is a spiritual prophecy, not referring to physical, literal swords and spears. He's talking about the coming into existence of the kingdom of Christ, which is essential to God's scheme of redemption, as is Christ Himself. Let's move a little further. If we uh, proceed further in our Old Testaments, there are other passages that we could look at in uh, Jeremiah and uh, in the book of Ezekiel. Turn with me, though, if you would, uh, to Micah. Micah chapter 4, no, uh, Micah chapter 2, I guess it is, has an actual reference to virtually the exact same thing that we just saw Isaiah say. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, verbatim. The same prophecy that we read in Isaiah 2. He says, It will come to pass in the last days. The mountain of the Lord's house will be established in the top of the mountains, will be exalted above the hills. People, uh, and he says, And people shall flow into it. Many nations will come and say, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord. He'll teach us His way out of Zion, the law. I'm telling you, it's verbatim the same prophecy. Micah 4, verses 1 through 3. Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 5. Here are two Old Testament prophets. Isaiah prophesied around 750 B.C. 750 years before Jesus came to the planet. Isaiah and later Micah said... The mountain of the Lord's house is going to be established. The law is going to go forth from Jerusalem. All nations will be involved in entering into this. And uh, swords and uh, swords and spears will be turned into implements of peace. What was he talking about? What were these two prophets intending to convey? If you move on to uh, Zechariah chapter 1, you have another incredible reference. Listen to this. Uh, Zechariah 1.16, Therefore says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house will be built in it, says the Lord of hosts. A surveyor's line will be stretched out over Jerusalem. What's he talking about? The rebuilding of a physical temple for Jewish worship? You know, although Judaism had a tremendous role in God's scheme of things, when you come to the New Testament, it's clear that Christianity supersedes and supplants all previous religions, Judaism and patriarchy. Christianity is the focal point of God's intentions and purposes on the planet today. And so we've looked at three prophets, Isaiah, uh, Micah, and Zechariah. We went back and looked in Genesis. We looked in Deuteronomy. We've had a number of references to the coming Christ and to the coming kingdom. On our next program, we will proceed in exploring this more deeply. I'll be back in just a moment. Please stay tuned. I bring
I hope that you're enjoying the beginning of this study on the church. We're going to make this entire series available to our viewers in the form of audio cassette tapes. And you may be uh, placed on the list to receive a free set of these tapes if you'd like to write us this week at The Truth in Love. That's Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. Request the series on the church and our volunteer workers will package those and mail those to you just as quickly as they can. On future programs, we're going to continue our quick survey through the Old Testament and see the, the interrelationship between Christ and the kingdom, the church. And then we're going to move into the New Testament and see where God's great redemptive scheme comes to climactic fruition in bringing Christ and the church to their ultimate goals, their ultimate purposes in God's scheme of redemption. I'm telling you, in order to understand Christianity, in fact, in order to be a Christian, you not only must understand who Jesus is and His role in bringing about your salvation, you must also understand the church, His body, and its crucial role in the grand scheme of redemption. I hope you'll watch our program the next time we meet. We'll see you then. Speak.